Hey, Mike, how you doing? Always a pleasure. Doing well. Thank you. Yeah, nice to see you. Um, so let's get right at it. I was reading about this idea with cryptocurrency, and I do believe that Mr. Cernovich yourself has covered this before. I believe, I'm not sure, you'll have to correct me, but I, I thought that I read this a while ago from you. There's this idea with crypto that you can band together a group of people, okay? And we actually talked a little bit about this in a prior episode when we talked about the Greek philosopher Epicurus. And one of the things that he did was he set up this commune. I, I call it a commune, but a group of friends that live together, okay? But there's this idea that at some point in the future, and what, what let me back up. What triggered this in my mind is the fact that I read this news article today that said that the state of California, as fantastic as it is here, and I will tell you, I love living in California. I live in Napa Valley. The food's amazing. Okay. The weather is incredible. I mean, it can be 88 during the day or 58 to 62 every night. I mean, it is just the most perfect climate. It's, it's, it's a dream. I mean, I, I, I live in this perfect Mediterranean climate, amazing food. There's a lot of culture here, you know, San Francisco's, uh, you know, close by, there's just so much to see and do. So California is amazing now, but we do have all kinds of problems high taxes and all these other issues. So I read this news article that stated that California has the slowest growth rate in the state's history going right now. So the first quarter, the slowest growth rate um, in the state's history. So there's this idea out there that you could, as let's say a group of people get together and pool your resources, if you will, on the blockchain or as crypto. You get a whole bunch of guys together, you know, a whole bunch of people together. And then you go somewhere, like let's say to the state of whatever it is, the state of Kentucky. And you say, hey, I've got a thousand people. We've all got our entire wealth transferred into crypto. And we're going to, and we'd like to negotiate with you to move to your city. All of us. and. What are your thoughts on this whole idea? Yeah, it's not as crazy as people think. So one of the beauties of the blockchain and especially crypto is you have a wallet and you can, the Bitcoin's in there or it isn't. There's no way to fake it because it's a decentralized um, way of verifi verifying. So for example, if you say, hey, I'm Mike Bolin and I have, and I'm saying your name wrong, I, I butcher my own name, it's okay, Mike Bolin. And you say, five. I, I, I add uh, consonants and sounds that aren't there. I still call. You're, you're giving me a French flair, which is. Yeah, exactly. Nice. A little. Yeah. I always add that a little bit. Maybe it's that California up talk. Yeah. Leads into everything. I can call you Cerna V. Exactly. So you, you can claim, oh, I have all this money. Here's a screenshot of my bank account. Or here's a right. screen. Everybody now, the big scam with the at least to the younger people is they post screenshots of their Shopify stores, and I'm like, oh, anybody can go and Photoshop anything. But right. with crypto, you say, no, here's my Bitcoin wallet address. There's either a Bitcoin or a thousand Bitcoins in there, or there isn't. You you can't lie. You can't fake it. Okay, so, so I, I'm a, I'm I'm a crypto uh, neophyte. New. So explain this to me. So where do I go and get my 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 crypto wallet, so to speak. Do I go to a store and buy this or is it an online thing? Well, you could. So there's different types of wallets, hardware wallet or cold storage as it's called, and then there's software wallet. So one wallet that I use is Exodus and I don't keep a lot of money in there, but you can just have it running on a computer device. Now you don't want it to be your daily use computer because if you lose it, with crypto, you lose it, it's gone. Crypto okay. is- Dream personal responsibility. If you lose your debit card or somebody steals your debit card, you call your bank, you cancel it. You're not even responsible for unauthorized charges made past a certain amount. Same thing with your credit card. Somebody hacks into your bank account and steals all your money. That's not your fault. That's your bank's fault. Okay, with crypto, if you lose your 
this uh, key. If you lose your keys, that's it. Sorry, there, there is no centralized person. There is not even a customer service rep. They're just, it's impossible to ever retrieve. There are actually okay. all kinds of stories about this that are mortifying. Bitcoin used to be not even worth a penny. So people are like, oh, I have this funny money. I have like 100 Bitcoin. Uh, that's cute. I have a couple bucks. And they have it on a computer and they lose their computer. And all of a sudden, the Bitcoin boom happened. Like they're mortified. Tens of millions wow. of dollars in the trash. Really? Yeah, you, just, you had it on your computer. I mean, think about it. You have, like I was a venture, um, I made a venture capital investment into some company and it's been diluted so much that it's not, I don't even know where the, the shares are. I forget the name of the company, right? I took the okay. tax loss last year. Then you think about it, you have like worthless money and that's what Bitcoin was. It was a fun little kind of thing. And then you realize, oh, this has value. Well, there's nobody you can turn to. Let's say you have a key or you don't. And you so is it like a is it a multi digit like weird number like XPQ three nine you know whatever? Yeah, there's your keys, right? Okay, it's, it's all encrypted, and there, there, you have pri there's a public key which is your Bitcoin wallet, and then there's a private key. And to access your Bitcoin, you have to have two keys. They, they it's called and a I, signature. Can you put it in your mind and just remember it? There are people who that's the way they have it. If you have a long okay. enough memory. Yeah, then you can remember all the digits. Then that's what people do. Or a lot of people write it on pieces of paper. There are people who they write their keys on. It's like titanium, so it's fireproof. And okay. It, yeah, which depends on the level that people go to. Most don't go to that extreme. If you have a lot of Bitcoin, what you would actually do is you would have the Bitcoin on a hardware wallet, a Trezor, or a Keep Key, or something, and then you would put it in a bank safe deposit box. Okay, yeah. so you got like kind of double protection. So. Yeah, it's like if you have gold bullion, do you, you know, would you keep $100,000 of gold bullion in your house? I hope not. Even in a safe, I hope not. Right. And that's what people do. And so on the other hand, too, Bitcoin is proof of ownership. You, that, that's yours or it isn't. So if you tell me, oh, I'm, I have a million dollars in Bitcoin, well, okay, show me your Bitcoin wallet and then move a Bitcoin. And if you can move Bitcoin, okay. then that means that that's your Bitcoin. That's your ownership. So that bypasses fraud. And there's even ways with smart contracts where you can have money crypto held in escrow. So if a certain condition is followed, then the crypto is automatically moved beyond your control. And that's is a smart contract. And that's where things are headed. So, so if a bunch of people wanted to leave a country, they could say to a government like Panama or Costa Rica, people talk about different things. No, this is verified assets and all the money could be held in a sort of a trust of sorts. Okay, here's $100 million. You can see the $100 million is here. Once this condition is satisfied, then, then all the money could be whatever given to the government or put in investments. There's all kinds of various ways. Like you can buy, for example, citizenship in St. Kitts and a few other places. So this would go beyond, the plan would go beyond buying citizenship. You're buying. You, uh, let me stop you there. How, how do you prove that, let's say everybody pools their, their wallet together into one other wallet, okay? How, are they transparent where, say I wanted, say, say you and I and 100 people, we put together 100 people, we did like kind of an offering almost. And we said, hey, who wants to join us? Mike Bolin and Mike Cernovich are going to pool together a billion dollars in personal net worth and, uh, from X number of individuals. And then we're going to go and we're going to literally go and tell the government of Haiti that we're going to take over the island and, and we're going to transfer this to you, but you have to give us ownership of the island or something. Okay, so how, how can you see the, the money's actually in there? Is it transparent? It's just the wallet address, right? So you can Google, there's even public figures who got into Bitcoin early and you can Google their names and their Bitcoin wallet and you can click and see every transaction that's ever been made, every where it's been moved. So if I tell oh, you, here's my Bitcoin wallet and you go to my Bitcoin wallet, you can even, one of my wallets are, are public. So you can Google it and say, okay, this wallet is processed, whatever, eight Bitcoin or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Here's where it all was moved to. Here's when it's completely open and transparent. That's one of the ironies where people call Bitcoin anonymous. It is and it isn't. It's actually 
not anonymous that people know what your wallet is because now they can trace every penny that ever passes through, but they don't know who sent you the money. That in that regards, that's okay. why it's not. So it's very complicated. That's why Bitcoin, there's all these simple narratives around it, whether people love it or hate it. But if you go into the weeds, there's a lot going on. Now, the idea about leaving would be crowdfunding a sovereign. And by a sovereign, I mean, you need a functioning state, a functioning government. The minute you, you get in, they're not going to you know, meet you with machine guns and machetes or something and hack you up. So you wouldn't negotiate with Somalia because that isn't a sovereign. But you could but negotiate. You, but it seems like the blockchain in some ways could allow you to negotiate with a Somalia or a Haiti or something that's slightly unstable because maybe they don't get all the money until you get in there and kind of get your groove on. But it's not functioning government. There's risks of coup and there's all kinds of other problems. That's why when people talk about it, they usually have uh, mostly functioning government like Panama or Costa Rica. Costa Rica, I don't think would be interested. But it, you, and that's also why it's a thought experiment, but it's also complicated. So that's why Peter Thiel talked about boat cities or something. The, uh, uh -huh. so, and, and here's why all this stuff matters and why it's complicated. To travel, you need a passport. We all take it for granted. I go to the show, I get a passport. But right. there has to be a sovereign that's recognized by the UN in order for that passport to be valid. What some people do on an individual level then is they go right now, I don't know if it's still big, but it used to be St. Kitts. So for between 500,000 and a million, and you go there for a month, a year or something, you can become a citizen and then you can, you're now a citizen of St. Kitts. What people realize is we're not free. We're not free people. We think oh, I'm a free person. I can travel the country. No, you can't. If the U.S. says we're canceling your passport, you're now a man or a woman without a country, literally. Mm -hmm. there, so there has to be a sovereign and it has to be recognized. So then, okay, let's say you find a sovereign. It's going to be, I don't know, Venezuela 20 years ago. Well, you pick the wrong sovereign and there's a coup and now suddenly what goes on? Or if they vote in a socialist government, because any democratic system is subject to abuse, right? You, you right. say, okay, Argentina at one time was a great place, but then they hit inflation and bondholders have fall. There's all kinds of things going on in Argentina that people aren't really paying attention to. But that conceptually, that's the idea is what, how would you crowdfund a mass exodus from the U.S.? How would that happen? What would it look like? What would negotiations look like? And then you realize this assumes executive authority. Can you imagine a thousand people fighting with each other about what sovereign and the backdoor dealings and people bribing everyone else to go there. Yeah. Oh, we'll tell them to come to our country. And then there's all kinds of money exchange backhands. It's complicated, but people are thinking about it mainly because it's hard to envision the U S as being the future. It's hard to envision the U S as being anything other than an empire in decline well, there's a lot of talk about that right now. I mean, I, I hear that from people in my friend circle. You know, the more, I would say, uh, enlightened people, the, you know, higher level thinkers, they're not asking, well, gee, do you, you know, you think we should retire in, you know, South Carolina? It's more like, hey, you know, have you thought about where you might go, you know, in 10 years when you have a little bit more money and you're almost like a sovereign yourself, you know, where, where would you go? And I, I do hear that a lot. So yeah, there's a lot of talk about how America is maybe on that plateau, right? Well, and, and the flip side of that, of course, though, is now that I'm, you know, 41, you're how you're in your mid forties, late forties, whatever there's, yeah. but I remember too, when I was a kid, Japan's going to take over America. Like, there's never been a time in my life where America wasn't over right? America's right. all, oh, the Japanese, it's taken over, they're buying everything. It's over for America. Now it's China. But the, the flip side of that is most, we've lived through enough of those panics to think, I think it is a little bit different this time. There, things really are heading in kind of a, a direction that's really harmful for entrepreneurs. You look at Medicare defaulting, Social Security, they're going to have to start fleecing somebody, right? They're going to have to and, and we all know that they, because you can see it happening in California with people, fecal matter in the streets, where goes California, there goes the nation. And then there's a well, risk of violent backlash coming. So normal sane people like us are going to be caught in the middle and we have to think about these issues now. 
Right. And that's that's kind of what brought this up. Right. Is how can you have a state that is so beautiful and fantastic as California is and so many, you know, wonderful people here and free thinkers and just really cool, creative types and, and all this great stuff happening here. Yet people are not moving here and people are leaving here. I mean, that's not good. It's really not good. Yeah, there's net migration from California. Yeah. Though, what, what I tell people, especially younger, under 30, is the, you, California was a dream. There, there are songs about moving to California. Led Zeppelin, a uh, famous song about you know, going out to California, Bob Seger, Hollywood Hills. Right. There was always this mythos of California, and it really used to be the California dream. I'm only here still because of family commitments. There's no way in the world I would be paying the taxes that I pay and dealing with the crappy roads and the potholes and the government abuse. And in California, there's pension funds that are going to be a real problem. It's a real crisis in San Francisco. Can't re- there's not a lot of freedom. You can't really own the kind of guns that I want to own. Mm-hmm. For me, it's just, so it is beautiful in a sense, but uh, Idaho's beautiful. Cordae Leone's right. beautiful. There's a lot of places. <laughs> Montana's beautiful. So what we're seeing now is a net exodus in California. But what's happening this is because this is people, and this is why my views on a lot of immigration issues are not based on anything racial. It's based on the, the culture. People are leaving California and going to Texas and going to Idaho and going to Montana and not thinking, oh, we just ruined a state with our ideas. We're going to these states that are great. Let's change these states and remake them because that's how your cultural software works. We're going to come right. over and now we're going to reform Texas and get, you know, get these rednecks and everything fixed. Like, wait a minute, you just ruined a state. You, you're leaving a failed state. So why are you bringing the ideas that were imprinted in your mind into a state that is still fully functioning? So then you realize, okay, the net migration to California is now going to make the entire United States like California. Now, because of the way the Senate, which is anti-democratic, and I say that as a good thing, Fortunately, the founding fathers made it so that mob rule can't fully take hold, at least not yet. But eventually, the, we're gonna, you're going to start losing the Senate seats because there's, there's net migration from California. And no sense of, it really does trigger me when I see my liberal friends say, so I don't care if people are liberal. Be liberal, be conservative. But if you're saying, I got to leave California, taxes are too high, just can't take it, there's no freedom, businesses are overregulated okay, then how about you move to Texas and just shut up? Don't vote. Don't, don't you like you're, you're part of the problem. And now you're trying to remake these other states in the image of a failed state. And that, and then of course, and then, you, and then of course that's a problem too with um, net immigration to the U S is we're prioritizing people from failed nation states. And you would think people would say, Oh, I'm, I'm from a failed nation state. We tried socialism. Didn't work. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm leaving. I'm leaving the socialist country because socialism doesn't work, but that, of course, is not what happens. People come over because people have been programmed. All of us are programmed. That's the point of this right. podcast, Mindset. And yeah. just saying, oh, I can't believe it. This is terrible. I'm not going to remake this in the image of where I came from, but the cultural program is, is so strong that unless people put active work in, they're going to bring it along with them. So how do you see, do you, do you truly believe or see this playing out where you get a group of people, almost like a public offering, if you will, of uh, the best and the brightest, they're the smartest and the most creative or, you know, uh, great thinkers, et cetera, or, or ex- exceptionally strong business people that band together and actually go to a sovereign and say, hey, I want you to carve out a, uh, a 10,000 person city for us or something? Well, that's the idea. That's the thinking behind it. And then, of course, there's right. always, yeah, there's always a sovereign risk that you do negotiate with a sovereign and then they'll, they'll backstab you or if it's democratic, even, even if they make a good deal with you in 10 years, things might have shifted. And then they vote in somebody who's going to come, you know, because, oh, what's up with all these rich foreigners? There's always going to be the othering, right? Oh, people, you would think, you would think, right? But this is not how the world works. You would think, just like in America, we hate the people who give us jobs. If you, you know, 10,000 people relocated to a sovereign, 
the people there would resent eventually. They might welcome it at first, but then human nature is what it is. You adjust to a new normal, and then you start to resent this people who would be viewed as kind of an overclass or colonizers, or you can imagine what, and then they vote against those people. There's always going to be that kind of risk. And that's why I don't, I, that's why the, the kickstarting the idea is one of those great ideas that, that libertarian men in Silicon Valley kind of dream up. Because you have to ignore a lot of truths about human nature in order to view it as a workable idea. However, as a thought experiment, it's conceptually interesting. And then you would think, well, yeah, what is a sovereign? How, how would you create your own sovereign? Well, could you create your own? I mean, do you feel that you could create your own sovereign? I mean, that you could say, hey, um, China, I want you to carve out. We're going to bring X over here and you're going to carve out. I don't know, 18 square miles, and we're basically going to have like a Hong, like Hong Kong was pre-1999, where it's kind of part, but not. And, um, you know, and it's almost like its own little nation state. I mean, is, do, you, do you ever see that happening? Well, you, until you get your, your heads cut off by the dictators, right? So it could, it, ironically, the only way it could happen... <laughs> guess that could happen i mean right yeah or would be with uh, people were trying that with panama there was a huge uh expat movement in panama and costa rica that was that was the idea then there was actual peter schiff and others were doing even though the puerto rico is technically part of the u.s an expat movement to puerto rico because there's no personal income tax in puerto rico and but then they had a big hurricane and then you realize oh i thought i had a good kind of gig but where the one hurricane and things, everything could kind of completely change. And that's one of the issues arising with Panama, Costa Rica, again, Argentina, people talked about. So you would need to make it work. You would need to work with a Western style democracy, but we now know the foibles of Western style democracy because 20 years it almost, it completely change. It seems like you could almost put in a, a constitutional amendment. Let's just take like a Puerto Rico. Okay. So you put in a constitutional amendment that gives this, you know, group that's coming in from this, this negotiated group that's relocating there that you give them some type of master voting class or something where they can override, you know, certain things that may, um, you know, disturb their presence in that state. Um, I, I see. I see. Like, there's a lot of ways that you could negotiate this and contract this. Where it, it seems like, especially with smaller, talking like almost, I'm thinking of like island type, you know, uh, sovereigns to where you know uh, Antigua or something like that. Like, you could almost do it in in those type of countries where they are, you know, they they stand on their own. Do they have a military? Not really. I mean, Haiti comes to mind. You know, because they could, Haiti could, you know, actually prosper from that, right? From doing something like that, I would think. Well, yeah, but again, you always have the risk of what happens if they just say, no deal, we're going to cut your heads off. What, what you'd say, then you have to have your own private military, your own private military contractors, and so maybe right. Eric Prince or somebody would have to be involved. So it was a lot more complicated than a lot of people would realize. But, but again, it's useful for people to think about because we're running, in a way we're running out of space, which sounds weird, but where, like, where can everybody go to? And there's still a few states in the US and I, I think what you're going to see because there is network effects, people, enough people have to sort of leave. And a lot, a lot of people are being driven out of finance and tech and other industries if they're, not radical communists. So because of that, they're thinking of where to leave, but then you have a collective action problem. All this, again, is human psychology. There's a collective action problem. If, like, like Silicon Valley, for example, if mm -hmm. there's 10% of people who are Trump-friendly, not Trump, pro-Trump necessarily, but Trump or Trump-friendly, and, and at least don't ha they have a don't tread on me mindset, like, hey, don't hassle people for supporting a major candidate, a political party, right? If all of those 15% of people just said, no, you're not going to fire people for politics. No, you're just not going to, or we're going to take all of our money and leave, then the culture would shift immediately. 
because you can't take on 15% of people who are entrenched. If you think about why all these companies run scared, they're afraid of two or 3% of the population. If that just really right. abnormal freaks, Oh, we're going to run a boycott. Those, these aren't millions of people doing boycotts. These are 20 people on Twitter. Maybe if you're lucky, you get a hundred people on Twitter. Yep. These aren't millions. Who cares? This is a speck in the ocean of the market. Right. So, so if the good guys, and I consider people who are tolerant of political diversity to be the actual good guys just said, no, we're not going to do it. Or they just said, okay, we're going to leave. All of us who love freedom and love America, we're just going to leave and we're all going to resettle in Boise, Idaho or something. Then you'd have a network effect and then you would start to see change that way. And that's why, again, I keep returning to the idea of a thought experiment. The thought experiment would be, if and this is how people listening to podcasts should think, if I were leaving, who would I want to bring with me? And <laughs> you're going to realize, oh, I'm around a bunch of losers that I would never take with me, right? Rocket ships yeah. taken off. You can bring five people with you. Each you've got five people who you're going to bring with you. you then yeah. ask yourself, why, why aren't you hanging out with only the people that you would want to resettle another area with? And that's the, the useful mindset lesson. That's a great, great way to analyze this and look at it. So it sounds like you're saying that maybe this experiment, if you will, is more realistic within the confines of the United States and maybe a state within the United States that's, uh, you know, maybe a little bit more open, um, you know, like maybe in Idaho or something like that. I don't even know if Texas is still that, but North Dakota or something like that might be. Uh, it might be more feasible to do it within the confines of the 50 states. Oh, and it's going to be the Western states. You're already starting to see that in Whitefish, Montana, where yes. in Whitefish, Montana is more centrist or center left, but it'll you know pivot a certain way because again, people are leaving California and taking the bad ideas that is making California crash. It, they're bringing it everywhere else. It's cr it really is to me. There is a lack of like humility and I've made enough mistakes in life. That's why when people ask me investment advice, I go, ah, you know, and I'm way better than average. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to crash the car for you. I'll tell you what to avoid. You know, don't ever go all in on a company or something like that with your life fortune. But right. I, I have, I've been hit enough where I'm okay. Maybe I don't know everything. As I politically though, people still, they've learned nothing. They think they know everything. And there's no sense of ownership. We ruined the state. I'm leaving the state because of the policies I believe in. I need to find new and better policies or at least conform to the new place you're in for a couple of years. That's what I don't get about people. You leave California for Texas. Okay, go be a Texan for two years. You don't need to vote. Don't act like you know everything. You just left California because of what they did to the state. Nope. Right. Doesn't work that way. Yeah. That's a, it's, it is a very interesting thought exper experiment, and, it, and I, I actually see it as something that could play out in the future, especially if you have, if, it, you know, for California and some other states where you just, I mean, I read something about if you want to sell hot dogs, you know, on, on a street card in New York City, the amount of paperwork, it's like 52 pages or something of paperwork to fill out to get a little sticker to put on your cart so that it's legal to sell a hot dog. I mean, at some point, this stuff just gets so absurd that you just tap out and say, no, I'm just not going to do that. And so as that progresses, and it seems like those types of policies never go away. They just get another layer added on to them. And people, I guess, eventually just throw in the towel and say, I can't do it anymore. So I certainly could see this as an idea that matures. And then you're, you're able to maybe, so maybe you negotiate with, Greenville, North Carolina, and you say, hey, we're going to move these 10,000 people here, almost like what Amazon's been doing with their HQ thing, HQ2. Um, you know, you could almost do that with a group of uh, super high producing people. So I, I think yeah. that will happen. Yeah. yeah. Or if it doesn't happen, it's good for people listening in. Who are you going to take with you on the rocket ship? You can bring five, you can bring five people not including right. your kids because everybody you want to bring your kids. Maybe, maybe you don't want to bring your kids, but yeah, you can bring five people who are not immediate family members. Who are you going to bring with you on the rocket ship? Who would come with you? Well, that's great. Okay. Well, Hey, good talking to you today. And uh, until we see each other again. Yeah. And people listening in go to mindsetsquared.com 
We have a new group launching soon, two weeks, one week, depending on when you hear it. Go to mindsetscore.com to find out more about that. Awesome. All right, Mike, good talking to you.